Wow, welcome everybody. <laughs> welcome to our conversation with author Sean Dwyer, whose recent book, A Quest for, Tear, is it, for Tears, is selling out like hotcakes um, at local bookstores, wherever it is, wherever it is on consignment at this point, <laughs> right? So um, I want to give an introduction to Sean and then uh, we're going to we're going to do some interview questions. I want to talk to Sean a little bit about his process of writing this book because this was really an epic process for him. And I think he has a lot to share with us about book writing and publishing in general. And we're, we're going to get a chance to hear a little bit uh, from the book and then we'll open it up to questions. So um, Sean Dwyer teaches Spanish at Western Washington University and is a well-published writer, which is to say that he sends his stuff out often and it gets picked up often enough. As an advocate for new writers, he hosts both English and Spanish language open mics at local bookstores. He's a native of Gary, Indiana and now resides in Bellingham, Washington with his wife, Maureen, his hairless cat, Luna, and his goat, Bob. Sean is also a dear friend of mine and a graduate of the Narrative Project nine-month Get Your Book Done program, and therefore it wasn't hard for me to twist his arm to come and speak with us. Yeah, thank you, Sean, for coming. Thanks My for hanging pleasure. in. Except for <laughs> the arm. Feeling a little sore. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to it. Let me ask you a few questions. Let's start by having you give us a synopsis of the book, A Quest for Tears, and what does that title mean? What's up with that? The book, you hear me okay, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yep. The book is um, a chronicle of the, the Big Bang and the aftermath. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think it details about two minutes of my life prior to the accident and then it details um, three plus years of recovery from the brain injury yeah and the um the goal of the book was to illustrate what goes on in inside the human brain as it heals also to show some of the pitfalls that a, a traumatic brain injury survivor my face and also those that caregivers will face. So um, that, and the reason it's called A Quest for Tears is that uh, among the few remaining um, glitches that I have, one is that I'm neurologically incapable of crying. And um, so when people are standing around sobbing for some good or bad reason, I stand there and I look stoic, but I'm not. And um, not having that type of catharsis uh, makes me feel a little bit different from other people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on a quest to get that part of me back. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you can't cry. I cannot cry. You can't cry and you haven't been able to cry um, even when there have been some really significant things that where that would have been um, a good release for you. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so Sean, um, do, would you be willing to read a little bit from the beginning of the book where the whole journey starts? Yes. As a matter of fact, and I just happen to have that available. I'll bet you do. <laughs> okay. So this is essentially the beginning of the book. Um, I'm driving from Fairhaven on the south side of Bellingham, Washington, toward downtown. My route takes me up a two-lane road that hugs a condo-topped bluff on my right and overlooks a steep drop to Bellingham Bay on the left. To my right, ground cover, green even in January, holds the earth in place. To my left, the expanse of the bay, dotted with a variety of watercraft, sparkles in the waning sunlight. Northbound, I have the sun at my back, low in the sky, not bothersome in my rearview mirror. On this stretch of road, named the Boulevard, I drive through an empty pedestrian crosswalk. I round a curve and approach a crosswalk ahead sign, which alerts me to a second crosswalk a bit farther ahead, its sign covered by shrubbery. Standing at the right side of the road are two college-age men who are waiting to cross. A glance in the rearview mirror tells me no one is in my tail, on my tail, so I slow and stop. One of the men nods his thanks and steps into the crosswalk. He focuses on something behind me and his eyes widen. He pushes his friend away from the road and leaps back onto the sidewalk. 
my gut does a flip. I prepare for a possible impact. It won't help to watch the mirror. I put the stick in neutral and nestle into my seat, trying to relax to lessen any injury if I get bumped. I don't have time to put my car back in gear and race forward. A thought flashes through my mind. I may lose my Honda Civic's third bumper in 12 years. I listen for the screech of tires. I spend five long seconds praying that the driver behind me will stop. The tires never screech. Maybe the oncoming car stopped. I wait for the pedestrians to step into the road again. I hear a bang right behind me that sounds like the lid of an empty dumpster dropping, echoing. My seat slams into my back and head. I prepare to fly forward and I wince at the thought of getting a face full of airbag powder. Instead, my seat gives way and I fall flat on my back. My legs fly up, my right shin scraping the dash. It burns, but a moment later I forget it when my seat catapults me skyward. The shoulder belt squeezes the air from my lungs, but it doesn't support my head. I feel it snap forward on my neck, cracking my chin on my sternum. I'm lying against my seat, which is at a 30 degree angle from the horizontal. I hear gravel on the roadway louder than it should be. My eyes focus and I look up through my moonroof at the trees that overhang the sidewalk. The Civic rolls for a few seconds and it eases to a stop with a gentle bump as the front tire brushes the curb. The engine is purring and I want to turn it off in case the gas tank is ruptured and the car is going to blow up. I can't reach the keys from my position. I wiggle my toes, they rub against my socks and relief washes over me. I lean forward on my left arm and a searing pain throws me back into the seat, onto the seat. It might be broken. I roll to my right, get painless leverage and push myself more upright. I put the gear shift in first. I reach for the keys, but my steadfast engine sounds so sweet that I hesitate to shut it off. I don't know how long it will be before my baby returns from the repair shop. I give in and turn the key. The mirror from the sun visor has fallen intact into my lap. I pick it up with my good hand and place it in the cup holder. I don't want it to break. My phone is still lying on the passenger seat. I grab it and dial 911 in case no one else calls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sean, um, do you have any, first of all, thank God you're alive. So grateful for that. Um, you know, everybody here, I think, knows Sean's been a friend of mine for a really long time. And um, he talks in the book later about how I was actually the first phone call that he made. And because um, his brain was kind of rattled. And um, so it was, uh, you know, I wasn't in this with him, but I've been in it from the beginning. And um, just to have so much gratitude that you're, um, that you're with us and that the injuries weren't more significant. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, w it occurs to me, I want to ask about what your life was like before the accident. But after you read that scene, I was thinking, I also want to ask, how long did it take you to write that scene in its current form? C is there any way that you can kind of put a quantity on that? I can, because uh, in June of 2015, one of my Red Wheelbarrow colleagues said, let's go over to the book fair cafe in Bilge of Books and write. I said, cool, I haven't written but a few words since the accident. And so I went and the first thing on my mind was to write that scene. And so I did write that scene and I wrote a really terrible version of it when I look back at it because I brought it, it was the first thing I turned in at, um, for the narrative project uh, in October of 2016, so a full year later. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it before I turned it in, I of course tweaked it because I could write somewhat better by then. But I saw missing words, I, things like um, maybe I opened the to my car and got out, <laughs> things that that egregious. And also it it, it was flat. There were there were it was not at all uh, a vivid. Uh, reconstruction of of what happened and so in a sense I started it in June of 2015 mm -hmm. but when I turned it in then I got feedback from my fellow writers the three people in my uh, little critique cohort I went uh, I was able to improve it a lot 
Mm -hmm. and now another thing that happened was I wrote it in past tense mm -hmm. and the uh, the director of the program said why don't you look at it in present tense why don't you just mm -hmm. try that who was that Let's see. Mm -hmm. I know I was smiling at your um, the director of the program that would yeah, be me. That, that's you <laughs> and you said why don't you look at why don't you try it in present tense see what happens and mm -hmm. you know when I did that the book like exploded mm -hmm. it became it became not an attempt at literary fiction or anything. It became a real vibrant story mm -hmm. of, of what has happened. And so yeah. uh, I think it took me from, but it took me, uh, I turned it in in October of 16, got it back and probably worked on it over Christmas break, a school break in December of 16. Mm -hmm. But by the time I was comfortable with it, it was probably March. Yeah. Because um, while we were racing to get to 10,000 words in December, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't really make myself. Uh, when I'd look back at it, first of all, it was still hard, for, really hard for me to read any words and make them find ways to improve them in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So it took me about four or five months on that little chunk. Yeah, I think one of the things that I really wanted to ask you about is um, t to invite you to talk a little bit about what your writing life was like beforehand and then after, because um, because I know that you were very near the end of an edit for a novel. You'd gotten some feedback back from Laura Lee, who's here with us tonight, and um, and you were really in the throes of that when this happened. And I, I knew you to be someone who was r really writing regularly and it was kind of a daily part of your life. But then, then suddenly you were sort of not even able to, to find words at times and mm -hmm. emotions were up and down and the head injury really sort of shifted that whole arena of your life. Can you talk a little bit about the before and after in terms of, of creativity and writing? Yeah. Well, um, first thing that people need to know is I have identified as a writer since I was six. I first uh, wrote a story and illustrated a little book, Unbidden, when I was six and a half years old, like Christmas time of first grade. And, and so I've written all along and I, I have written this uh, sort of what wound up being sort of epic-ish uh, end of a world story that uh, in, I remember the memorable February of 1991 when I wrote 300 pages in one month. Wow, and, that's incredible. Well, you know, that's 10 pages a day. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's, that's how Stephen King has so many books. He writes, if you write 10 pages a day, you have a novel done in one or two months. Mm -hmm. And so the novel that I was, um, finishing the edits on the first draft of it in 2007, I wrote in three months. Wow. And then in uh, two, 2009, um, I started a novel on January 1st and finished a 300 page manuscript on February 28th. And so two months to write 300 pages for that one. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, my, my system was not to go by word count actually, but it's a little bit easier for me just to go by page numbers. Uh -huh. So I would sit down and write five pages a day, which gives you a novel manuscript in 60 days. Yeah. And uh, sometimes the pages would have like extended dialogues, which was great because I got done faster. But often I would be at five pages and be in the middle of a scene and still really primed to go. And I'd write 11, 12 pages. Yeah. Um, and so that, that was just something that I could do. I could sit down and, and be immersed in a world and just basically transcribe their story. Yeah. And so you could see, you could actually see a story unfolding in your mind and you yeah. could, and you could get it down on the page and you were disciplined and prolific. And mm -hmm. um, it was a sort of a wraparound part of your identity. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and I was able to do that, you know, while I was teaching, I would just get up in the morning and do some writing and then I'd go do my job. And it, it, it didn't like take extra, it didn't fatigue me. to do Yeah. That. And then after the accident, nothing 
for one thing, all the uh, people around me went silent, completely silent. And you mean the inner people, the characters, the, the inner people. Yeah. yeah, no, I had an awful lot of people talking to me on the outside. You okay? You okay? You okay? Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, buddy? I'm good. Um, but yeah, the characters went away and I, I would liken it now to uh, going from from me being in the milieu to me uh, looking at a like a 15 inch flat screen TV trying to decipher what's going on in there. And I so no just flat work and mm -hmm. what little bit I could do. And I was never able to uh, write anything of any length. I wrote a couple of short stories here and there that mm -hmm. were uh, potentially have some down the road. They might be okay if I really bump them up, but they're short. And I could I could never uh, I could not have started a novel from scratch. I think I can now. But I'm not sure. So, what made you? Uh, well, we'll see. I think once you finish the current the mm -hmm. current thing you're working on, we'll find out. Yeah. Um, because you'll want to move on to something. Um, so. So I, what I really want to understand is um, what made you decide to commit to writing this book? Because, you know, kind of given the state of, uh, you know, and, and the frustration around being able to have something happen in your mind and transcribe it onto the page, you know, what made you decide that you wanted to tap? Because it's not like you came into the narrative project saying, hey, I, I'd like to write a couple stories. You're like, I want to write a book. and so. Um, I mean, what made you decide that that was that this was the book that you wanted to tackle, and that writing a book was the right move for you at that point in your recovery? I um, I remember I was standing in the kitchen at home, and I said to myself, "Wow, the, what's going on in my head is really, really weird." And I know a lot of people get concussions, bad. bad you know, traumatic brain injuries, and they, and and I saw myself at, in a sort of a sweet spot. You have, if you have a Venn diagram, you have the people who get injured and are not writers. You have the people who are get injured and are writers, and then you have the people who could who heal enough that they could write a book, but they're not writers. And you have the writers who are too injured to tell the story. And then you have that sweet spot where you have somebody whose head is good and is a writer. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure this is the right representation, but it's close enough. It's yeah. the idea. And so I thought, and this would have been about two months after the accident. I said, I cannot do this now because every time I look at a piece of one sheet of paper, like uh, a form to fill out for medical stuff, I get sick to my stomach and have a massive headache for hours afterward because of the visual cortex damage. Um, and so um, I said, I can't do this now, but when I can write, I need to write this because partly out of gratitude uh, to the cosmos, to God, to karma for giving me life, yeah, more life. And also because I said, you know, what I'm hearing from doctors and professionals and people who are crying out for help, you know, caregivers who don't know, they're at their wits end, people with TBI who are unable to get really the help they need. There needed to be more books about this. Yeah. Okay? And really we did. should say that you're, that you've been uh, involved enough with the TBI community that you were actually, it's not like you were at a certain point, you actually educated yourself about the way um, traumatic brain injuries affect other people. So you were starting to understand that there needed to be some more and better um, story and information out in the world, right? Exactly. Yeah, because uh, when I started going to support groups and things like that, I could see how weary the caregivers are and how hard it is to get respite. And I first thought that maybe my role was to provide respite, but um, it seemed more that providing uh, information and trying to uh, change how the world looks at traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was important. 
So let's talk a little bit about how about how you tackled the writing of this book, because most mm -hmm. of the people on the call are, are writers and everybody's sort of um, in, in some various stage of writing their book. And maybe some people are in the flow right now. Good for you. That's so awesome when you're in that space. And uh, some people are probably up against some barriers, whether it's um, the inner critic, you know, saying what's what's the freaking point of this, you know, or or maybe um, a skills issue, like I really don't know how to navigate this this element of the story. But you faced, I mean, you faced all of those normal things also, but there were also some really practical things. So can you talk a little bit about what were some of the big barriers that you faced and how you navigated around, through, under, because I feel like you snuck, I feel like you snuck around all of the, um, barriers in order to write this book. Like every time something came up, I get headaches. Okay, well, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to write in the dark. You know, it was like one thing after another. So can you talk about some of those? Oh yeah. Well, the very first thing that made it at all possible was that I, I would take a leave for just the big headaches and they'd go away eventually. But uh, I had this nagging sharp knife-like headache up in the top of my skull and neurologists have prescribed gabapentin for that, and poof, it went away. But it took two months to get to him. Um, and uh, so once the migraine stuff was put on the back burner, then I was able to consider writing. But um, so I took the one chunk that I had written, which was what I read, and I fixed it. And then... <sighs> What I did was, um, when I write a novel, uh, typically I write chapters as individual documents so that I can move them around as needed, but then I got Scrivener, so I can pop them into there and move, there's a, on the left-hand side, you can just move the title and it moves all the text up so you don't have to do any cutting and pasting. And um, so what I did was I sat down and I opened up Scrivener and I created a bunch of titles mm -hmm. for chapters and the titles were significant to me. It's all I needed to know what I was supposed to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Like when I was dead, I saw the light, which is a Hank Williams tune. I uh, knew that that was about when I was able to remove my sunglasses and things like that. And, um, so you made a list of, of scenes and topics scenes. that you yes. wanted to cover. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when the, what got that going actually was when I went to one of your retreats. And at your retreat, um, you had us do, uh, you gave us a big piece of newsprint and made a big grid and a, basically a calendar of what I was going to write on any given day. And I put about I don't know, 25 or 30 scenes that needed to be in the book. And I put them in the order that I would write them, which was not necessarily the order that they would appear. And um, as a result of that, um, I, I just transferred that all into uh, the Scrivener. And I had, so I had these scenes and I just wrote scene after scene after scene. And what I did was write frankly, the most traumatic ones. And that was because I hadn't had a ton of trauma therapy. And so they were still pretty raw. Yeah. And it was hard to write them, mm -hmm. but it's not like they made me cry or anything. <laughs> uh, eh. Dark humor. Yeah. <laughs> most of the humor in the book is pretty dark. Yeah. And there's and pl if plenty you... of humor, but it's dark. And if you look at the book, you can see that it actually is um, written in um, it, they're written by date, and each section is a page and a half, two pages, sometimes a little longer, but but they are um, not really long chunks of text. No. So you you created a, an internal structure for yourself that worked for the limitations that you had, which I thought was really smart when I saw the final product because. You know, I realized, I mean, since we, we worked together along the journey that um, that writing like a big story arc that had continuous text was going to be something that would be really hard to hold 
in, in your mind, but you know, at times early on, but also um, just as far as your eyes not being able to have that break in the page. So I thought that was a really smart adaptive trick that you did. Thank you. Yeah, it um, it was an adaptive tick, trick for me to be able to get chapters done. Yeah. Uh, and so, but also by it, it, by being concise, it allowed me to bring in more uh, more data, more different experiences than yeah. if I waxed poetic about the day that I was able to take off my sunglasses. That was, you know, it's fairly crisp, yeah. but it allowed me to talk about. Uh, maybe three other things within my allotted 340 pages. And, um, but the, what it did was, um, another thing is that the, since it was written by a damaged brain, people with damaged brains would be able to read it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it it's suitable for people who have either short attention spans or uh, short leashes as far as mm -hmm. reading fatigue goes. You can read a chapter, feel satisfied that you got that whole little story, and then put the book away and come back to it the next day. So that was kind of serendipitous. It wasn't that I did that on purpose, but it was the, the height of my capabilities. And it yeah. just happened to turn out to be something that's good for TBI survivors. Now, I, don't, I didn't put this in the list of questions that I sent you. Uh -huh. so. But, um, but I know that there were times, a couple of times along the journey where I heard you say, I really don't know how I'm going to get this done. Yeah. And so what I wonder is, what did you do with the voice inside of you that was saying, whatever it was saying, I mean, that's the only one that you shared with me. I don't know how I'm going to get this done. And I remember at one point, it was really about like how long you could sustain looking at the page. And I noticed, I mean, this is just for everybody's benefit, but I noticed that Sean did things along the way, like he made his page green because he couldn't look at the white for very long. And, um, at some point did some, got some voice recognition software to help a little bit with, um, the fatigue of staring at a screen. So I know that you did a lot of, um, really innovative ways of working with the, the eyes, the issue that was happening with your eyes. But what did you do with the voices? What were the voices in your head and what did you do with them? How did you work with those? Um, well, uh, one thing that I had going for me was that I had used Facebook as a journal. I'm not a journaler, but I did keep updating people. And it, it sort of was cathartic for me to say to people, yeah, well, today was miserable because I tried to do a crossword puzzle and I got three clues in two hours and that sucked, mm -hmm. things like that. Well, um, so what happened was as time went on, the stuff that was real, I could visualize. St events that did occur, I could remember them. Um, whereas uh, fiction, summoning up something that doesn't exist was impossible but if I would and, and but with, so with these stories they they existed in my head as memories mm -hmm. and so I was able to use that mm -hmm. now I've been called on about uh one inconsistency mm -hmm. uh already by somebody who said who remembered it differently and I was like oh okay mm -hmm. uh but whatever um just a tiny, tiny thing, but well, um, that's going to happen in memoir. Oh, it will. Yeah, absolutely. To anybody. But um, yeah, what made it possible for me to finish this book was you said, why don't you try typing with your eyes closed? And I did a little bit of that, but I was finding that I couldn't move as fast as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, with my eyes open, I typed 55 words a minute with mm -hmm. them closed, not quite that. Uh, and Maureen said also about the same time, why don't you um, use voice to text? So that's when I took the, those two things and I got the, um, I had Dragon Software as, a, uh, as an accommodation for my job. And while I couldn't use that officially because you know it belongs to the university, I did get a microphone and Microsoft Word had a, microphone in the upper corner and so I just hit that and go blah 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 and um 
so I had done all the trauma chapters and I was down to the triumph chapters basically. And I, um, I, I could tell I had pent up words trying to get out because the first day I did the, um, that I did dictation, I, I dictated 10,000 words. Uh-huh. And that was an eighth of the book right there. And then the other, and then there was another 10,000 that I did then just wrapping up little chapters here and there. Uh-huh. And so uh, the 82,000 words, 20,000 of it came as dictation, uh, which creates yeah. a different kind of editing issue. Yeah, but, totally. But you kind of make do. Well, it seems to me, I mean, just to, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize what I, what I heard from you around that pushing through element. One thing being that you found as many creative ways to face the particular challenges that you had. But the other thing is that, um, is that you looped in your community, you know, Maureen, me, your Facebook community, like all of the, all of the people that cared about you finishing the book and let other people brainstorm solutions with you too. And you found some that worked. Yeah. Well, if you look at the acknowledgements in the back of my book, the acknowledgements are longer than almost any of the chapters. Mm -hmm. And that's because the writing community, the friends, the family, everybody that can, everybody listed contributed in some way to making me want to finish the book feel that I could finish the book and, and I have a book. You sure do. And so Sean, um, I have, I have two more questions for you before we open space for other people to ask some questions. And one is really, what does it mean to you to have this book out into the world? I mean, it, this is your first book out in the world. Can you put words to what it means to you to see a book on the shelf and to see somebody buy it and to hold it in your hands and read from it and sign people's names, you know, dear so-and-so, love Sean. I mean, can you just put some words to that? Yeah, I wrote my first book when I was six. It didn't get published. It doesn't have an ISBN. It did get a, a, a reaction out of my mom. She just stared at me like, oh my God, what have I created? Um, but I, I, I was writing this science fiction thing that I thought I would have published by the time I was 21. That didn't happen by the time I was 30, still didn't happen. I wrote my, these novels that I did finish and that are actually not bad pieces of work and they're not published because, uh, they still, you know, they still aren't quite there Mm -hmm. and I don't mean that I'm too picky I mean even Laurel said you know you should try this and I tried it and it's really going to work well (laughs) but the whole so the whole thing there is that I didn't have a book and if I had created a bucket list when I was 50 that would have been on it that would have been number one most likely is to have an ISBN attached to a full-length book of my own Mm -hmm. even you know, when I got into the first um, Red Wheelbarrow anthology that I had had a couple of journal stories published, but being in an honest to God book in a bookstore, that was a thrill. But then to have one where I'm not only the headliner, but it, <laughs> it is huge, absolutely huge, because especially given what it took out of me to get that book yeah. written. And, yeah. and I'm just so... I I can't possibly uh, express how wonderful it is to have your book published. So if you're not there yet, boy, you need to just not keep going, keep going, buckle down and get this done. You will not be sorry if you keep just persist. Remember a page a day, it's done in a year. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So that kind of brings me to the, the last question that I wanted to ask you is that, you know, for, so everybody who is on this call is at some point, um, yourself included, myself included, like we're all somewhere along the line in the book journey, whether it's the first book or the 10th book. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if you had two or three pieces of advice, like absolutely do this. And, you know, it's going to be a little different for everybody, but 
you know, if I, I put the title here, if he can do it, you can do it because it really is true. It really yeah. is true that if Sean can pull this off, um, anybody can pull it off um, because his, his barriers were very, very significant. And so now that you've pushed through all those barriers, what would you say to everybody on the call, two or three pieces of encouragement or advice? Yeah. Well, first the encouragement, um, is that whatever you're writing, it is worthy of being written. And if you start to doubt yourself, you need to stop talking yeah. to yourself until okay. the book's done. Number two, um, advice. Consistency is big. If you you can if you put it put your book down and just walk away from it for a month or two months picking it up is going to get that much harder it's like if you're a runner uh i when i ran track in high school cross country and whatnot it said if you took two days off from training you would be like way, like a week behind where you were mm -hmm. and and you you should tr do what i'm not doing and write something every day um, and again, uh, if you do the math, if you can write a page a day, 365 days later, you'll have a manuscript that's already too long and, uh, for today's market. And if you write five pages a day, you get it done in two months and then you have all the rest of the year to play with the edits while you're writing the next book. And you get so far ahead that you can have like 10 books published after you die. <laughs> <laughs> which is useless to you, but may be good for your errors. And then the last piece of advice, because I didn't rehearse this, but I always know what I'm thinking about this. So da, 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 um, yes, whenever you look at work that you did previously and you're going to edit it and you say, oh, wait, this is crap. My take on that is it's not that it was crap, but that you're a better writer now than you were. And so you recognize errors and issues that you would not have recognized a month ago because you got better. That's the only reason. It's not that you're a crappy writer now. It's that you're better than you were a month ago or whenever. I love that. Thank you so much, Sean, for that. And that's my own. I didn't read that anywhere. I came yeah. up with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll buy yourself. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think the one thing that I would, that I would add, because I know I watched you do this is again, the accountability and support, just surrounding mm -hmm. yourself with people who know what you're doing, oh, yeah. who won't let you off the hook, who are asking incessantly, annoyingly about what you're up to. Um, and, and giving yourself deadlines for getting to certain points along the way is really helpful. Sean referenced the 10,000 word challenge which we always do in the nine month program we do it in the summer in either july or august and in the winter in december because it's such a crazy month so we do it during like the hardest months the vacation month or the uh, holiday month and we just say you know hey race yourself to ten thousand, and if you do you get a prize but we don't tell the, anybody what the prize is until mm -hmm. later yeah well well and for perspective kathy tupper wrote a hundred thousand words uh, while I was at about 6,000. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that was the other thing that I think was really important is that, um, is that Sean set realistic goals knowing his current situation. So, well, um, and I'd have to say that you set the realistic goals really, because you said, I know we're not going to get you to 80,000 words or 60,000, but let's see what we can do. And I got to 40 or so that yeah. first time around, which I considered miraculous, but if you hadn't given me the permission to write what I could and I had tried to write what everybody else did, I would have failed. Yeah. So it's, it's, but that's your wisdom right there. Yeah. What Sean's referring to is that we have a, um, either a 50 or a 70,000 goal for people who jump into the nine month program. Um, the reason for the difference is that some people work full time, have kids, you know, like their lives are very, um, very, very rich and full. And, um, and some people who jump into the program are retired and have some more spaciousness. Um, and so 
we, we have, we ask people to choose either a 50,000 or a 70,000 goal to work all the way through their, their, their draft, whichever draft they're working on. Usually it's the first, but sometimes it's a second draft. And we knew when Sean came in that he wasn't going to be able to meet the 50,000 goal because he couldn't sustain sitting at the computer for very long. And so we altered it. We figured out a goal that we thought we could, that he could hit and, you know, and, and you actually exceeded it. So yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, let's, let's open up for questions, shall we? And see what people are curious about what they want to know. So um, if you, if you have a question for Sean, all you need to do is to um, wave your hand or um, if you don't want to be seen on the screen, you can put a note in the chat um, and just say that you have a question and Ani will keep her eye on that and um, help us to um, make sure that we call on everybody who has a question. So anybody wanna jump in with a question for Sean? Scott, I see Scott's hand. So unmute Sean, thyself. It's good to see you again, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, quick question. I can't remember if you self-published or if this was a manuscript you sold. Um, I was being nurtured all along, I think, uh, for by, by a publisher. You can't hear him. You can't, you can't hear, hear me? Sean. Huh? Hello? Can you hear us, Scott? Um, hold on. Okay. Can you hear us? What happened? Can okay, you hear me? Still? All right, there we go. Okay, yeah. you can hear us? Yeah, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Got go it? Go ahead, Sean. Yeah. Yep. Okay, sorry. so um, the, uh, the person who asked me to sit down and start writing in the summer after my accident turned out, wound up being my publisher, and I think she had uh, this ulterior motive in getting me to start writing about my accident because she saw the po potential for a book there. <laughs> and so she wanted me to write it and then, uh, not really an ulterior motive, but as the project went along and it looked like it looked promising, she offered me the opportunity to publish through her. And so it's a small press. Um, I did contribute some advance money myself to getting, um, some of the goods, um, in, like getting a cover made and things like that. I, if I had done, uh, if I had self-published, it would have cost me more than what it cost me to give to her. Plus, uh, I'm making back that investment mm -hmm. at this point, breaking mm -hmm. even at least and beyond. And so, um, but it's a small press and uh, it's, it has a distribution chain and things like that. I think you would call her a hybrid publisher. It's a hy hybrid, yeah. So she won't just take anything. No. She'll, she's um, picky about what she takes, mm -hmm. and um, and she she works with each author to for to create a package that works for that author. Um, so there's some vetting, um, but there's also some contribution from the author. Right. Would you have done, sorry, may follow up? Would you have yeah. done anything different in regard to publishing? What were some of the hurdles that, that maybe you do different? Uh, my, um, the circumstances working with her were perfect for me because I, uh, if I had, first of all, I didn't want to uh, try to go for the gold with a, the gold as it were, with a big, five publisher because it would have been two years before the book hit the shelves and so that would be two years lost in my my real goal which is to be able to provide uh, education to survivors caregivers and the medical profession and so I, I wanted that book out if I had tried to self-publish but through Kindle create or whatever they're calling it now KDP if I had tried that I would still be trying to remember that I needed to someday talk to somebody about a cover. I had absent, one of the things I've lost to some degree is my executive function. So I have to put really detailed notes in my calendar about how I'm going to get through my day or else I will just forget to do stuff. 
and I and stuff that's back burner type things like get somebody to edit this manuscript. Oh my goodness, there's just no question that it would have. I would still be trying to self publish, and um, and if I'd even gone with a small press that had a big catalog, it would have taken forever to get the book out. And just uh, just Stone um, basically put me at the front of the line because mm -hmm. of the significance of the story. Yeah, and you know, I think another thing to um, to take note of when you're trying to decide what um, what to do, Scott, about which direction to go with with publishing, um, because Sean had because Sean had a really nice big network. Um, doing some hybrid or independent publishing is it was a good option um, because he could he basically everybody who is his Facebook friend his you know who's on social media with him who's in his community because he's really skilled at that community building piece he's se he's selling those books quickly so he's making his money back for his investments um, you know that he made along the way to write the book and um, I think that you have to, you really do have to do all of that, whether you're publishing independently or you're publishing traditionally. That's the platform. Piece. Yes, that's the platform piece yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. that he had. He had the right kind of platform to, to publish and quickly sell that book to. Um, so he may make more money doing it this way, make it back and get his book into the hands of the people he wants it to get into more quickly because he got it out in the world while he had the energy. And Sean, in fact, you're, you've been invited to speak at the national conference of. Well, what? the, uh, the, the Washington state brain injury conference in Tacoma, um, yeah. people who in Bellingham, who knew my story brought me to the attention of the uh, state organization. And I just got an official word this, this evening, the, the guy who does these things said I am the opening keynote yeah that's so fantastic congratulations on that. yeah. that's really cool but I well, mean, and there's gonna be you know a thousand people there so I'm gonna take 200 copies of the book well exactly and if you didn't have that book then it might not have paved the way for this invitation and it then would, yeah. being able to reach yeah no I, I would not have gotten a chance to talk just because I wanted to talk yeah they're looking for people who have some way of proving that you know they've done their some authority their and the book yeah. is uh, the book is like your passport yeah for that yeah super and cool it, you know and the book is turning out to be good for people who have any any kind of trauma not not just brain trauma but any kind of uh setback in life because of what the they're saying talking about the resilience and the tenacity yeah so yeah it's good so yeah. good let's see if there's another question mm -hmm. anybody else have a question they want to ask yeah, I do. I do. Okay, oh, go for it, Laurel. <laughs> Laurel Yeah, so um, I, first of all, thanks for this conversation. It's really wonderful to hear. Um, you know, Sean, I remember you telling a lot of people, including myself, um, that you felt so differently after the injury. And then I was very interested when later you said you recognized that you had over-explained it. My question is, um, did that continuous explaining and talking about it, do you think that helped you to write about it? Or were those completely two separate things? I guess I'm just wondering if that repetition reinforced anything that um, enabled you to write more effectively. This is such a great uh, editor question. It's like, how did you find the themes? How did you find that ribbon? Did this do it? And and yes, um, the more I got the uh, got cemented in my mind. See, here's here's the thing. I have my vi what I take in visually doesn't make it to my memory banks, which is why I can't read novels. But what I hear myself say. I can remember and that mm -hmm. that's documented because of some testing I did that my audio goes straight to the memory where it should and the video does not and so when I tell people what happened to me and I over, say it over and over and over 
in great detail and whatnot, uh, that allowed me to remember what to transmit to the story. And, you know, Cammie, you mentioned uh, that we wrote this in little pieces, but there is an arc. Yes, there's, there is. There's totally an arc there. I just, uh, we just did not make long chapters that flow into each other. They're little, chin, 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 but it's a connected dot rather than a follow, ride the wave. But it's, yeah, it's totally there. Because yeah. you made sure that I had an arc. Yes, because I'm the arc bitch. <laughs> I will make sure you have an arc. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer your question, Laurel? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was a really good question because uh, it's, it's good, really perceptive of you there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, really perceptive. I mean, that whole idea of like, you know, as a therapist, I hear people telling stories over and over and over again. And, you know, long past when I might even be weary of hearing it. And but they're always looking for what's the meaning? How does it connect to this other thing and that thing? So that's that's really um, observant. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel bad for my therapist who hear, had to hear me rehash, rehash this stuff. She's dead because of it. So. I, I don't think that was it. Sean. That's not like, no, yeah. right. no. <laughs> well, she is dead. Yes. I'm not over that yet. I know. I know that's really, that's a topic for another conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Ani. Sean, are you thinking at all of um, making a recording of the book or a podcast or something where you read chapters of it? I'm thinking of my friend who has a traumatic brain injury and she would love to have this information, but she can't read. Um, and she would love to hear your story. Um, when I was at Chanticleer Book Conference, they uh, they had a special guest who has a an audio podcast slash audio book um, editing program called Hindenburg, and I already did the intro. Cami heard it, uh, and I think that it, once I get a feel for recording my book, I am going to do an audio book. My guess is I'll do I'll record it in December and try to get it out. Yes, Great. so Great. I would say sometime early in 2020, there will be an audio book of this. And I've decided that get, th these words are too personal to hire somebody else to read it. My yeah, novel, so I'll never even try to read novels, but this book, mm -hmm. I am going to persevere until I do it right. Mm -hmm. And yes, I will have an audio book. And Great. I could see putting it up chapters at a time as a podcast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That would give you a chance to let your brain rest a little bit in between too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that for her, podcasts are a way that she stays connected with the world because she can't, okay. you know, read or be out in the world much anymore, but she's listening to a lot of podcasts. So I feel like that could be a really powerful. Is this someone I know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell her. Um, yes. Yeah. It's great. Coming. Great. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Anybody else have a question for Sean? Some people don't have their video on, so you might just have to unmute yourself and say, yo. Oh, okay. If, if no one does, I have yeah. another question. Jump in there, Laurel. Yeah. Um, so Sean, uh, I haven't talked to you for a long time about your fiction. So I've been very interested as you've been talking about this book. Um, did writing this book help you start to move back to other things or where are you with that right now? One uh, beautiful thing about writing this was that it did start to create those uh, those neur neurological connections that are required mm -hmm. for writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there were days that I could, you know, write five or six pages of a chapter or something. One, I was sitting at one of Cammie's events and Ani was sitting right next to me and I pulled out a notebook and just wrote a whole chapter longhand, which is rare for me. And it was not even a memory. It was a, a recounting of a dream I had had that I realized was significant about my brain telling me how it was rebuilding itself. So, and that's in the book, it, it made the cut. And, and so that was like the first step back toward being able to work with, with something more fantastical or whatever. 
And the, I'm back in the program, I'm in Cammie's program again, and the novel that I am doing is the one that you uh, have edited for me, and it's getting, um, I'm following to the letter your suggestions, and we're gonna nail this thing down. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm glad to hear that, it's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be yeah. good. It's very exciting to see that, that unfold, and, um, you know, the, the brain repairing itself, or I don't know if it's repairing itself or if it's growing new. Cells, oh, it's creating you know? bypasses. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can, it's a lot of things I can just feel that they don't happen the same way, but they happen. Yeah. And so that's really all that matters. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to look forward to another big partay when that book oh, is yeah. ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 in there, Dwyer. Dang. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Super inspirational. It looks like, um, Ani, let me see if anybody else has one. Um, well, I, have, I, I have a question that came up through the video chat. Okay, good. Video yes. Chat. Yes. So it says, um, sorry to come in late and hello and thank you. As a TBI survivor to another TBI survivor, what was surprising to you along the writing and the post-publishing process? It's from mm -hmm. Langmine. Mm -hmm. okay. What was surprising What's... along the... the writing and then the post-publishing process. What was surprising about the writing was how creative I had to be to find ways to get the words on the paper, which is not the part of creativity that I am used to. I'm used to just transmitting words. And, and so thinking, okay, this isn't coming out fast and it's not coming out well what do I do? And one of the big things is to have a support community, people who will look it over. All, my critique group uh, helped me with a number of glitches, things. I, I could still recall specific things that I was told, like times that I had just uh, left, the, left my audience high and dry on something. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so getting that feedback is huge. Community, community, community. And the post writing thing, oh my God, the, the editing process. For me to edit a whole book, even though I wrote it, editing the thing was just so laborious. It took me, I, I had, I got, I hired several people. I hired Ani, got some really good edits there. And, um, and my publisher, her business partner, did a, a story arc, uh, a developmental edit for me. Um, and so between those, um, I was able to put stuff together. But I, I couldn't sit and do that whole book. Any, any typos in that book are my fault. But I have not been able to sit and read this book. So that, as, that is a, that's a thing. So Ling Ling, you need to... Uh, get you know muster all the support you can get get the dictate the words if you have to to get them on to paper mm -hmm. and then let let a whole team of editors do the rest and just approve the final product that's yeah. that's what i really learned about all this yeah, I mean, one of the things you're really pointing to here, Sean, I think is actually even deeper than writing. And it's about like a level of commitment to the self and mm -hmm. to the, the well-being of the self and how your dreams are important. I mean, whether it's writing or whatever it is, that your dreams are actually really important and whatever it takes to commit to those dreams is worth it because they're your dreams. You're, no one else is going to carry them through for you. And that's what money's for. You know, it's yeah. to, it's to make, um, that self-fulfillment happen. So I think you're talking to something even deeper than, um, bookmaking, um, or maybe it's bookmaking yeah. as a metaphor for the rest of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, that, that's, that's true. That, that is the thing that whatever you really need to achieve in life, you have to go for it yeah. and you have to find a way. Mm -hmm. Even when there's barriers and there usually are. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. well let's, um, let's just make sure that people know. Uh, one of the things that I promised you is that um, is an opportunity for you to say like what you're passionate about right now and, and 
um, how people can support other people um, with TBI, where they can find you, you know, sort of like what you're involved in. So give us the, give us your spiel about um, supporting people with TBI. If you have a traumatic brain injury, you need to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to follow the protocols that are suggested to you. If they say stay out of light, stay out of the light. If they say wear sunglasses, wear sunglasses. I wear the big wraparound thingies from Walgreens that go over my glasses. And yeah, you know what? I look like a dork. And you know what? I don't get headaches. You can have headaches or be a dork. Or if you have a headache, you might look like a dork without the glasses. So there. Um, for the caregiver, be kind to yourself. Because if you are taking care of somebody 24 seven, like I know people who are with traumatic brain injury who don't sleep much. And so they are awake till two in the morning, get up at five and the caregivers feel obligated to be there for them all the time. And you gotta get respite. General public, but you look fine is really, really hard to hear. And I, I would say things like, well, today I forgot to uh, put on my shoes when I went to work. And I'd invariably get something like, yeah, you know, I do that all the time. You don't have to feel bad because, you know, we all do that. Except I know what I always did and what instantly became a feature of me when, after my accident. Like when I said that I put the leftovers from dinner in the car and pointed at the refrigerator. Oh, I do that all the time. Yeah, I didn't. You know, the th I could say, you know, I was a complete, you know, I can be a space cadet and I could forget to do this, I could forget to do that. But the level of inability to keep track of what I have to do in on a given day is a new feature. And so, um, Keep in mind that everybody that you talk to who claims to have a traumatic brain injury uh, probably isn't happy about having to admit that. And uh, compassion, it really is the, the best currency that you have for helping them. Mm. And that's essentially, um, well, what I have found is that I've not found more than two or three people that, that actually actively mocked me and said hey, you're smart so and one of them was a neuropsychologist you're smart you don't have any problems you're an idiot doctor <laughs> is my response because mm -hmm. yeah i have problems mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah so um you're uh you're a part of an association that right. supports people with um traumatic brain injury is mm -hmm. there is there a place to contribute? Are there things that other people can do who are just general community members? Yeah, um, BIAWA.org, Brain Injury Alliance WA, uh, is the overarching organization. And there are several chapters uh, around the state. Some areas do not have coverage, like Island County does not have anybody there. Mm -hmm. um, but I go to the Bellington group. So if you uh, know somebody that you want to direct to us, we meet the first Thursday of the month at 6.30 p.m. And it's at 3333 Squalicum Parkway, which is down the road from the hospital mm -hmm. in the same, in the Lutheran Education Center or something. And uh, so we have our meetings. And what we time is that at, Sean? 6.30 p.m. Thank you. On the first Thursday. And um, we have a meeting for survivors and a simultaneous meeting for caregivers. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it has proved to be invaluable to me uh, for the uh, perspective I get, the knowledge I acquire, and just the camaraderie among those of us who all understand what we're going through. That's it's, so great, Sean. And I'm imagining that people who live in other areas, they, um, they can find um, a group nearer them through this oh, yeah. association. Okay. Yeah, well, the, the state 
uh, yeah, BIAWA.org will tell you where your local chapter is. Okay. I know that they have people down in the Tacoma area, Seattle, most areas of the state, Spokane has its own. Um, and also in other states, um, when I was started to, when I started to look for places to talk, I saw that um, maybe half of the states have annual brain injury conferences. Often they're in March because that's Traumatic Brain Injury Awareness Month. Okay. So. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, I just want to thank you for being here, and um, and I think this has been really encouraging. I think um, you know I'm super inspired by you all the time, and just how you stay so committed to what you've got in your mind that you want to do, and don't let anything get in your way. And um, I think you've probably heard that a lot since this book has come out. But you know, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan, and I know there's a lot of other big fans here on the call, and. Um, so I also want to say that, you know, at the narrative project that we support writers in getting their books done and Sean is like our poster boy for if he can do it, you can do it. And so, um, you can go to the narrative project.net and see what we have coming up. And we always offer a free mastermind coaching call. So you can sign up right there on the website for, um, a half hour free coaching call and we'll help you mastermind the arc of your book. Because once you have the arc of your book and you have a sense of where you're going, um, then you need to put the pieces in place and then sit down and write those scenes. But you need a map. And so um, what we like to do is we like to sit down with writers and help them get a map for where they're going, which is the roadmap that you'll use, you know, even, even though the destination might change along the way because revisions do that. But that initial map is so crucial to propelling you forward. So um, thank you, everybody. Let me put, me put myself back on gallery view so I can see all your gorgeous faces or your names. I know what some of you look like, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you for hanging out with us tonight. It's been I'm, really I'm good. I'm grateful that Wendy. you came to listen to this. I, I just can't, can't thank you enough for the support for this. Appreciate you're, it. You're so welcome, Sean, and just so, so happy. We do twinkle fingers because we don't applaud. Twinkle fingers to you, Sean, for getting it done. Yeah. <laughs> and back at all, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Guys. Lots of love, everybody. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Have a great weekend. LOL. We'll see you soon. <laughs> LOL. Bye. Bye-bye.